Camouflage in a modern sense usually means to blend in with your environment. People spend tons of money on clothing and equipment, both modern and historical, looking for that right shade of green or brown to blend in. But was it always like that? Well, today on the Deerskin Diary, we are going to look at early American camouflage concepts. So stick around. There's bound to be something hiding in here that I think you're not going to want to miss. Now, Native Americans practiced the art of the camouflage for thousands of years before European contact. The use of animal hides to either lure in prey or to disguise themselves to get closer to game animals was a concept that was common among tribes east and west. But that style of camouflage wasn't only used for hunting by Native Americans. As a matter of fact, in what's now West Virginia, the morning that Lewis Wetzel and his brother were captured by Wyandots, Wetzel's brother looked across the cornfield and said, hey, I think there's a black bear over there. And Wetzel looked and said, I don't think that's a black bear. And it turns out it was most likely the Wyandotte Indians using a bear skin to get closer to the Wetzel homestead to conduct surveillance. Warfare and the technology used to wage it was changing because of the American frontier. Traditional military uniforms were changing to adapt to the woodland warfare that seemed to plague European armies at every corner. Coats were being shortened and occasionally changing colors. Lighter, faster, and more maneuverable troops were being molded by the landscape. And that spark of a new concept, camouflage, began to emerge. But it didn't necessarily mean then what it means today. Despite being around for thousands of years, it had really only been in the last hundred years or so that scientific leaps have been made in the art. Now researching this topic in the 18th century is pretty difficult because there's not really a term you can search for. The term camouflage itself wasn't coined until the early 20th century during World War I by the French. And camouflage became the craft of the camoufleurs, who were the artists who practiced making up items for the stage. So I really had to dig through descriptions and compare them with other concepts, both civilian and military. Now, according to modern doctrine, there are three main techniques for camouflage, and that's blending, hiding, and deceiving. But only one emerges as a common and preferred tactic during the 18th century. Probably the least common technique in the 18th century was blending, and that's the ability to use color and shape to blend into the environment. Now, it's hard for us to understand that in the 21st century because nearly every notion we have of camouflage is based on our ability to blend. Things like this assaulter ghillie, this, this three-dimensional uh, laser-cut, ultra-modern piece of uh, equipment used for uh, three-dimensional camouflage and surveillance is, is kind of the norm of what we think about today. But blending in the 18th century didn't seem to be that common. Clothing colors varied widely to include hunting shirts. Quote, their whole dress is very singular and not very materially different from that of the Indians. Being a hunting shirt somewhat resembling a wagoner's frock, ornamented with a great many fringes, tied around the middle with a broad belt, much decorated also. Their hunting or rifle shirts they have also dyed in a variety of colors, some yellow, others red, some brown, and many wear them quite white. J. Smith, 1784. There were other outer garment colors that didn't seem to be very woodsy, like this red wool coat that's documented, along with these white woolen blanket coats. The declarant thinks that the Indian discovered Captain Brady, who lay behind the log. Captain Brady had on a French kappa coat made of fine sky blue cloth, which declarant thinks the Indian discovered above the log. We lay behind the log. George Roosh. Now, this natural linen hunting shirt right here um, eventually kind of takes on the color of the woods and that becomes very advantageous, but linen as a fabric, when exposed to sunlight, will actually lighten over time. But browns and other natural colors certainly existed. In 1791, Boone was noted to have been wearing a linen hunting shirt and moccasins, the color of leaves. And probably one of the more famous quotes was one by an author named McWhorter who said, quote, his clothing was colored in the ooze made from the bark of the chestnut oak. He would wear no other color. Now the tricky thing about 
researching a topic like this is that that quote is very tantalizing. It was referring to an 18th century scout or spy and, and his conquests and exploits. But that quote was actually written in 1915. So I have to take it with a good bit of skepticism as to how accurate and authentic it was throughout that scout or spy's entire life. Now the next technique we need to look at is hiding. Hiding usually occurred as a manner of convenience. The many cane breaks and down trees throughout the American frontier allowed people to hide within their shadows. It didn't matter what color you wore if you physically put yourself behind an object that no one could see around. Samuel Brady hid himself when surveilling the town of Sandusky by swimming to an island with another man and concealing themselves with driftwood and brush. He was able to watch about 3,000 Indians the following day. But even nightfall, offering its cloak of invisibility, revealed dangers not often thought of during daylight hours. And one night Brady crept even closer to a camp of natives when one woke up and approached his hiding spot. Brady put his forehead to the earth for concealment and soon felt, quote, warm water poured into the hollow of his neck as from the spout of a teapot, which trickling down his back over the chilled skin produced a feeling that even his iron nerves could scarce master. Deception became the preferred technique of camouflage during the 18th century, but how did we get there? Well, in order to determine that, we need to look at both military uniforms and civilian clothing and the role they played in society. Uniforms in the 18th century centered around identification with regimental coats, hats, and insignia, all meant to distinguish the wearer from everyone else, including the enemy. Regiments had unique uniforms that were non-standardized throughout the entirety of an army. Americans, British, Germans, Scots, and others all had distinct and unique uniform items that were designed to quickly differentiate them on the battlefield while also providing an esprit de corps for those units. Similarly, civilian clothing denoted class and stature. One of the most popular plays in the 18th century on both sides of the Atlantic was a play called High Life Under the Stairs. And that play was about um, a Jamaican landowner who started to suspect that his servants were stealing from him. And he decides to infiltrate the ranks of his servants to try to um, sort of oust this theft plot. Now, there was a popular song that came from this play, and the chorus in that popular song, which again was popular on both sides of the Atlantic, had a line in it that said, quote, and all in a livery. Now, livery is a, a term we don't use much in the 21st century, but it defines a specific type of uniform that would have been worn by servants. And the chorus of the song itself implies that this wealthy Jamaican landowner, in order to infiltrate and surveil those servants who may be stealing from him, would have to somehow look like them in order to get close. In 1760, James Smith said that, quote, as we enlisted our men, we dressed them uniformly in the Indian manner with breech clout, leggings, moccasins, and green shrouds, which we wore in the same manner that the Indians do and nearly as the Highlanders wear their plaids. George Rogers Clark developed intelligence about the town of Vincennes when Simon Kenton and his scouts entered the town on three consecutive nights by using match coats and dressing like natives. In July of 1758, George Washington himself said that were I left to pursue my own inclinations, I would not only cause the men to adopt the Indian dress, but officers also, and set the example myself. Nothing but the uncertainty of its taking with the general causes me to hesitate a moment at leaving my regimentals at this place and proceeding as light as any Indian in the woods. And at the Boston Tea Party, one participant named Josiah Wyeth noted that, quote, to prevent discovery, we agreed to wear ragged clothes and disfigure ourselves, dressing to resemble Indians. Now, perhaps some of the best commentary on the use of deception as camouflage comes from the accounts of Samuel Brady and his scouts. George Roos said that, quote, the declarant states that in obedience to the order of his said Captain Brady, he proceeded to tan his thighs and legs with wild cherry and white oak bark and to equip himself after the following manner to with the British clout 
leather leggings, moccasins, and a cap made out of raccoon skin with the feathers of a hawk painted red fastened to the top of the cap. Declarant was then painted after the manner of an Indian warrior. His face was painted red with three black stripes across his cheeks, which was a signification of war. Brady and his men fooled natives and whites alike, and this seemed to be their standard uniform anytime Brady believed that contact with the enemy was likely. Well, camouflage in the 18th century certainly didn't seem to mean then what it means today. And I hope that this deep dive into this very specific topic is helpful for you the next time you take that mental trip back into history. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you once again spending your time with me and we'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary.